Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India All right, so now that we have understood, uh, you know, when we are given an IID sequence, what are the different things that we, uh, you know, that we can characterize about it, you know, we can characterize the sample mean, the sample variance, there is a concept of degrees of freedom. And then there is also statistical inference, which is very interesting, you know, which gave us an idea that Z bar could be an erroneous understanding of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of, of mu and, and you may want to, uh, you know, rather than rely on this point estimate, uh, go forward one step forward and 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 evaluate a confidence interval, uh, which is for a given level of probability or uh, that you are likely to see Z bar values in. So in the previous lecture, we figured out a 95% interval confidence interval for the IID case for Z bar, which was Z bar minus 1.96 sigma hat over root n and z bar plus uh, 1.96 sigma hat by root n. So the confidence interval was in these bounds, right, uh, with the lower and the upper bound, right. So now we, we generalize this IID case a little bit. How do we generalize it? We introduce spatial dependence to the data, right. So we introduce specifically a, a metric or a, a, a measure of spatial dependence, which is spatial autocorrelation, which we have, uh, you know, articulated on this slide as covariance of pairs Z i and Z j for our given data set is given as sigma squared rho to the power i minus j in absolute terms, right? So the absolute value of i minus j is in the exponent and I can go from 1 to n, right? So now this gives us two distinct cases. One is when I is equal to j, that is when let's say we are talking about covariance of z1 and z1. Now covariance of z1 and z1 is nothing but just the variance of z1. This definition says that it's going to be sigma squared rho 1 minus 1, which is sigma squared rho 0, which is just sigma squared, right? And you can evaluate for any i, uh, uh, you know, case where i is equal to j, right? So I can, in general, I can say covariance z i, z i equals variance of z i is going to be sigma squared root of the power 0, which is sigma squared for all i goes from 1 to n. So the first thing it tells us that the variance of z i's is exactly the same, which is sigma squared, right? So I'm still working with an identical variance, uh, you know, uh, 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 case. But what is happening is that, you know, what happens is that as soon as I have i is not equal to j, right? We have, let's say we have covariance, for example, 1 and 2, we have variance, oh sorry, it's, it's sorry, it's going to be uh, sigma squared rho absolute value of 1 minus 2, which is just 1. So we have sigma squared rho. If I look at covariance z1 and z3, I will have sigma squared rho absolute value of 1 minus 3, which is sigma squared times rho squared. And then covariance Z1 and Z4 will simply be sigma squared root cube. And you can keep going covariance of Z1 and Zn will be nothing but sigma squared rho n minus 1, right? So now what's happening is that I have a distance metric sitting on the exponent of rho, so, right? So typically we say that rho is between 0 and 1, 
right? And it's, 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 it's an important condition. We'll see at some point in the course later, and we come to the idea of stationarity and all that, that rho, if it is higher than one, it can have uh, major consequences on what can be done with the data. Well, well, we'll see that we can't really do much. But anyway, for now, we'll just take rho to be uh, between minus one and plus one. And the idea is that, you know, when I, when I take any position in space, let's say position one, z1, I can have, you know, when I, when I move to z2, there is some dependence between z1 and z2 given by a multiple of rho. As I move farther away from z1, the dependence, you know, goes down exp uh, in, at an exponential rate uh, by rho squared, rho cube, and all the way to rho to the power n. Okay, so when I'm given my data set, right, so when I'm given this data set, right, so data set, let's say the data set can be ordered from z1 to zn, so I'm going to simply just put location, so this is a real space, right, so location 1, location 2, location 3, location 4, keep going, you have till location n, right, and the idea is at each of these locations you have data z1, data z2, z3, z4 and zn. So these are realizations on space. The idea is that the, the value that I realize on z1 has a dependence metric that specifies the spillover effect of location 2, spillover effect of location 3, spillover effect of location 4 and so on and so forth. Similarly, realize that I also have covariance of z2 comma z1 is also sigma squared rho uh, 2 minus 1, which is equal to sigma squared rho. So the idea is there is also a, a spillover in the opposite direction for all the values. Of course, as the distance, you know, sort of increases, the strength of the spillover declines. So strength of spatial dependence goes down. Now, instead of this real space being visualized as you know, a, 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 you know, as some kind of in, in, in a spatial sense, I could have also thought of it as a time, you know, dimension. So in case of time, you know, you had time period one, you had time period two, time period three, time period four, and time period n. And there also we have this understanding of, you know, autocorrelation, temporal autocorrelation, where, you know, value at t2 has a spillover from t1, Similarly, T3 has a spillover for T from T1. I mean, it also has a spillover for T2 and so on and so forth. The only difference between spatial autocorrelation and temporal autocorrelation is that in case of time series data, the spillovers do not go back. So the idea is because in time series, you know, time is unidimensional and unidirectional, what happens is that value that is realized that T equals four, you know, cannot have any effect on what happened in t equals 1 because t equals 4 didn't even happen then, right? So it, it necessarily will have only the effect will only be one way. That is the value that has happened in the previous period will have may have an effect on what has what is happening in the in the current period. But what's happening in the current period could not have happened, could not have any had any impact on what happened in previous period, just by the virtue that it happens on a later date. Right? So this unidirectionality is relaxed in case of spatial dependence or spatial autocorrelation. Right? So here the dependence, unlike uh, you know, uh, in one direction that is increasing time periods in case of time series data also comes back. Uh, so every entity has a spatial impact on every other entity uh, with a strength which is given by rho to the exponent of distance between those, uh, you know, between those entities, okay? So having understood this interpretation of this, uh, the, the co spatial autocorrelation structure that we are working with, uh, now let's go forward and, and, and uh, you know, uh, 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 evaluate different characteristics of this distribution, okay? So I'm gonna say note that, Zi's are still normally distributed with mean 
mu and variance sigma squared. However, now they or these let us say these entities entities are no longer independent. So, I still have an identical distribution, but it, they are not independent to each other, right. So, what happens at Z1 is impacted by what happens at every other location and whatever happens at every other location is impacted or is dependent to some degree uh, on, uh, you know, what happens at uh, location 1. So, this is, this is interesting. This, this is a very complex structure if you really uh, try and visualize it, start to visualize it. Right, uh, um, and remember, we are only working in one-dimensional space right now. If you, if we uh, go beyond one dimension and we look at set two dimensions or three dimensions, uh, you can imagine the math will really uh, become complex, and that's the point, right? You know, we uh, we uh, we can still work with those things in fairly simplistic, uh, you know, uh, with fairly simplistic, uh, you know, tools. So that's the point, uh, you know, that we will sort of see pan out in future. Uh, you know, in future lectures of this course. So, uh, we are working with uh, entities which are no longer independent and of course, we still care about the mean. So, what is the mean, uh, you know, the sample representation of mean mu. So, I am asking the same question. I am asking the same question that I asked in the IID case which was to say that, you know, what is the best guess of mu? Well, you know, at the end of the day, you know, what information do I have? I mean, my information that I have is I have a sequence Z1, Z2 till Zn. Of course, they are spatially dependent, fine, but that is the information that I have. So, my, my best guess of mu will still going, is still going to be Z bar, which is nothing but take every value, weight equally, by 1 over n and just sum it, okay. So, again, even when you have spatial dependence, the best guess of mu or mu hat is equal to z bar, right. So, z bar is indeed the best guess that data may be independent or spatially dependent. Now, what changes, right? What changes, you know, is variance of z bar is going to change, uh, you know, with respect to the IID case, okay. Uh, and to evaluate it, you know, let us, let us try and move forward, right. So, let us, so let us see. Uh, so, we want to, we want to not, we want to evaluate the variance of z bar because we know it is a random variable, it is composed of random variables, there is an error, I want to articulate that error and that error will come from variance of z bar and I want to get there, right. We want to evaluate uh, variance of z bar. So, before we do that, what I am going to do is I am going to sort of, uh, you know, uh, 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 try and go back to where we started, right. So, we, we had articulated the variance of z bar as variance of 1 over n summation i equals 1 to n z i and I said 1 over n squared uh, uh, and we had written this as summation i equals 1 to n variance of z i variance of z i plus um, 2 covariance of z 1 z 2 plus 2 covariance of z1, z3, keep going, plus 2 covariance of zn minus 1, zn, right. So, we need these pairs of covariances to be part of this variance definition. In case of IID, the covariance terms were all zeros. In case of spatially autocorrelated data, they are all non-zero. So, this yellow you know, the, the terms in the, in, within yellow curly brackets are no longer 0. In fact, we are given a definition of those and that is covariance of Zi and Zj, 
right? So we know, we know covariance of Z1 and Z2 is sigma squared rho. We know covariance of Z1 and Z3 is sigma squared rho squared, right? So what we are going to do is, uh, we are going to introduce a variance covariance matrix, which is a very concise tool of encapsulating these, these covariance terms in, uh, you know, at one go. So, uh, covariance of Zi and Zj, I'm going to write this in a variance covariance matrix. So I have n, I have n data points. So I'm going to have a n by n variance covariance matrix. Each, so I have n rows and n columns. The diagonal elements are going to be sigma squared. So each row is representing i's, which is one, two, three, all the way till n. And each column is represented by j's, which is one, two, three, all the way till n. So I have n rows and n columns. What happens is that given my definition, so the definition that I have is that covariance zi, zj is equal to um, sigma squared rho absolute value of the difference between the locations i and j such that i goes from 1 to n and j goes from 1 to n. So I'm going to use this definition and fill in the variance covariance matrix. Quite clearly, the diagonal elements are going to represent the variance terms when i equals j, right? So i is 1 here and 1 here. i is 2 here and it's 2 here. i is 3 here and it's 3 here. Similarly, i is n here and n here. So all the diagonal elements are going to be just sigma squares, right? So sigma squared, sigma squared, I'm just going to use dot, dot, dot to for you to understand that all the diagonal elements are nothing but sigma squares. Now let's come back to the off diagonal elements. The off diagonal elements are, so what is this off diagonal element here? This represents covariance Z1, Z2, right? The covariance Z1, Z2 we have seen previously is equal to sigma squared times rho. What about this element here? It is sigma squared rho to the exponent absolute value of 1 minus 3. So I have sigma squared rho squared. Similarly, I will keep going. I will have sigma squared rho to the power n minus 1. Okay. What about this element here? This is covariance of z2 comma z1. And this two will be nothing but sigma squared rho given my definition. And I'll have z2 and z3 again sigma squared rho because the distance between 2 and 3 is still 1. So sigma squared times rho. And you keep going, you have sigma squared rho n minus 2. Right? For the third row, which is third i, 3 and 1, sigma squared rho squared, 3 and 2, sigma squared rho, keep going, sigma squared rho n minus 3, okay? And then we keep coming down, okay, so, so we have here n and 1, so sigma squared rho n minus 1, sigma squared rho n minus 2, sigma squared rho n minus 3, and keep going. Okay. Similarly, you can fill all of these values and the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that the off diagonal elements are non-zero. In fact, they are a representation of spatial dependence. By contrast, if you were to consider the case of IID, what would happen? Okay. So as an aside, we're just going to quickly look at the case of IID. The case of IID. So in case of IID, if I were to sort of, you know, get to this, uh, this, this, this uh, variance covariance matrix for the IID case, I will still have the elements in the, in the diagonal of this, you know, uh, cells of these matrix, which will be equal to sigma squared, sigma squared, sigma squared. And again, I have I's one, two, three, all the way to N. Uh, in the rows and j's as columns 
all the way till n. But what is different between the variance covariance matrix in case of spatial dependence or spatial autocorrelation as specified with, uh, with the row parameter uh, is that while in that case, in the, in the case of spatial dependence, of the elements are non-zero. In the IID case, all of these of diagonal elements will be just zeros. So, right, so we are full, we have a much simpler case where everything is zero, right? One last thing I want to point out with the variance covariance matrix is that it is symmetric, right? So, <clears throat> you will see, uh, if you see sigma squared rho here, you see a mirror of it here. Right. If you see a sigma squared rho n minus 1, you see a mirror of it uh, on the, uh, you know, uh, uh, downward side of it as well, right. So, <clears throat> the left and right on, of the diagonal are, are symmetric. So, the variance covariance matrix is always symmetric, right. So, it is sufficient to just write, uh, so write down the once any one side of it and the other side can be automatically filled in because we know that it is a symmetric tool. So with this understanding, you know, you know, with this understanding of how to articulate the variance covariance matrix, you know, ultimately our aim is to figure out the variance of Z bar and we want to fill in these values of, we want to put in the variance terms and the covariance terms and so on and so forth, right? So basically what I am doing is I am, I am uh, summing everything everything, each cell of this variance covariance matrix, I'm summing it and I am uh, multiplying it by 1 over n squared, okay. So when you do that, what you're going to get is variance of z bar is equal to 1 over n squared. We can also take out sigma squared by the way, right. So in the previous, uh, in the, in the previous you know, uh, uh, on the previous page, I could have taken sigma squared out. I could have taken sigma squared out as a common multiplier from each cell of this matrix, right? So I, I can just take sigma squared out and I will be left with ones in the diagonal elements and off diagonal elements will be rho, rho squared, rho to the power n minus one uh, and so on and so forth, right? Okay. Uh, so here, what we are going to do is we are going to we are going to also take out sigma squared. So I'm going to have sigma squared over n squared and inside I have n plus. So all the ones at the, in the diagonal elements are being summed. I get a one, uh, an n. So this n is nothing but the sum of all the ones in the diagonal elements of the variance covariance matrix plus twice of n minus one times rows. So there are n minus 1 rows, n minus 2 row squareds, plus n minus 3 row cubes. And you keep going, you have 3 root to the power n minus 3s, you have 2 uh, root to the power n minus 2s, and you have a 1 singular row n minus 1. Okay. So, um, so remember we have taken this this twice, this two multiple out. So, you know, all of these are occurring, you know, twice of times what you are writing here inside the square bracket. <clears throat> okay. Now, this sum can be, uh, you know, rewritten as the following. So, I am going to, uh, you know, take out this sigma, uh, sigma squared by n squared multiplied by n plus 2 sigma squared by n squared times, uh, you have n times rho plus rho squared plus rho cube, keep going, plus rho to the power n minus 1 minus uh, uh, rho times uh, rho plus 2 rho squared plus 3 rho cube plus uh, n minus 3 rho to the power n minus 3 plus uh, n minus 2 rho to the power n minus 2 plus n minus 1 rho to the power n minus 1. Okay, sorry about that, little fumble there. Okay, 
So now it turns out that this first series is nothing but a geometric progression. Okay, so we have rows just increasing geometrically as a sequence. So we have row, row squared, row cube, row, row to the power 4, all the way till row to the power n minus 1. So you have a sum of a geometric progression, right? So it's a, it's a geometric uh, series. And this one which is deducted from it, from this geometric series, is an arithmetic, arithmetic uh, geometric series. Right? So, it is a combination of an arithmetic progression and a geometric progression and it turns out that we have, we can, we, we have these standardized, you know, formulae for summing a geometric progression as well as an arithmetic geometric progression. So, I am going to simply apply these, you can go and recall, I am just going to put a recall, recall, you should go back and check how to write down the sum of a geometric progression. So, sum of n elements that are, you know, characterized by a geometric progression and you should sum, you know, you should, you should go and figure out what is the sum of n elements that are characterized by a arithmetic geomet geometric progression. I am not going to solve these, so, uh, you know, provide these, you can, can check it in any standard, uh, you know, uh, uh, mathematics text. And you can use this to then write down the variance of z bar, you can simplify it as sigma squared 1 over n plus 2 over n rho 1 minus rho to the power n minus 1 divided by 1 minus rho minus twice 2 over n squared um, rho plus rho squared 1 minus rho and minus 1 over 1 minus rho minus n uh, rho to the power n, okay, n minus 1 uh, and that is it, which can be then approximated as, let me write it here uh, so that it is clearer, let me write it below, sigma squared uh, 1 plus rho over 1 minus rho times n, okay. So now let us go back and let us go to the next page and then contrast between the IID case and the case where we have spatial dependence characterized by uh, the, the row parameter. So we have a spatial autocorrelation. Uh, scenario or case where covariance of z i and z j is given by sigma squared rho modulus i minus j and the other case is we have spatial i equals 1 to n and j equals 1 to n where if we have spatial independence Right? So, we have seen these two cases, which is nothing but the IID case. Right? We, have, we have seen this and we have just uh, seen the uh, both the cases, right? so spatial dependence and spatial independence. So, IID and spatial dependence. Now, in, in, the, in the spatial autocorrelation case, my variance of z bar, it turns out to be sigma squared 1 plus rho over 1 minus rho n. Okay, I'm just gonna write sigma square over n to multiplied by one plus rho over one minus rho. And in case of the of a spatial independence case, this variance of z bar was simply sigma squared by n. So in order to contrast them, what I can do is what I can do is I can write rewrite variance of z bar in case of spatial autocorrelation as sigma squared over n prime where n prime is nothing but n times 1 minus rho over 1 plus rho. Clearly 1 plus rho which is a denominator which will be higher than 1 minus rho, right? It is going to be definitely higher that means n minus will be definitely less than n, uh, sorry n prime will be definitely less than n. So what we are seeing here is that 
this, the case where you introduce dependence in the data, right? The variance of Z bar, the way you articulate the error in Z bar, right? The, the error or the variance in this random variable Z bar is using a, uh, you know, a denominator on sigma square, which is N bar, which is, it is, which is an equivalent, which is an equivalent of spatially independent values of data, right? So this is equivalent spatially independent data, okay? So what happens is because of dependence in data, there is similarity in data. And what happens is that on the net, we have only n prime spatially independent values instead of the n values that we are actually looking at because there is dependence in data. It compresses or it kind of reduces the data size to an equivalent n prime size, which is obviously less than n in terms of, you know, uh, uh, evaluating the variance of Z bar. And what will happen is because n prime is less than n, variance of Z bar will be higher when you have spatial dependence relative to when you did not have spatial dependence. And that's because that, that basically says there's going to be higher error. There's going to be a different error in, in how good a guess is Z bar uh, of, of the population mean, right? So what we are actually saying is that statistical inference, right? So this will imply that statistical inference, right? Statistical inference was the bound of Z bar values, the bound of Z bar, the confidence interval of Z bar will now be different. Right? So now your, uh, you know, uh, will be different uh, than in the IID case, right? More specifically, you know, in the IID case, the 95% confidence interval for Z bar was given as Z bar minus 1.96 sigma hat over root n comma sigma bar or Z bar plus 1.96 times sigma hat over root n and you have a lower upper bracket, round bracket. In case when you have spatial dependence such that covariance Zi, Zj is equal to sigma squared rho i minus j for i 1 to n, j 1 to n. I'm writing it again and again because I'm talking about this specific example. This is not the most general answer. This is for this example for so that we understand the consequence one step at a time. So spatial dependence, which is given as covariance Zi and Zj, you know, uh, uh, it gives me, uh, you know, uh, 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 here the 95% confidence interval for Z bar will be given as the lower bound Z bar, which is exactly the same as the IID case, minus 1.96 sigma hat over root N prime. Okay, this N prime is lower, so I have a bigger bound on the, I have a, you know, a, a, a smaller lower bound than in case of IID and a higher upper bound than the IID case, right? So I'm trying to draw your attention to the point that you have a N prime in the denominator, which is different from N and N prime is less than N, right? So where N prime is strictly less than n. Okay, so now, you know, I'm going to end this lecture with a small exercise. So I'm going to say class exercise and then we will uh, end this lecture. We will come back and review this in the next lecture, you know, uh, uh, because, you know, uh, it's been a, uh, a little bit of a involved uh, material today. So 
um, uh, say you have a sequence of data, sequence of data, uh, data z1, z2, all the way to zn, where n is given as 10, okay, n is given as 10, and uh, there is a, 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 a spatial autocorrelation, correlation with the same structure as our example in this class, uh, but with rho given as 0.26, okay. Um, we have to evaluate, evaluate uh, an equivalent Uh, uh, of uh, independent observations, for the given case, right, the given spatial dependence case, that is I am asking you to evaluate n prime and Consequently, the new 95% confidence bounds for Z bar. And I want you to sort of go over this exercise and then we will evaluate it, uh, uh, we will solve it in the next class. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.